All right, uh, welcome everyone to a new episode of Young Researchers. Uh, today we have Cassia Butzik from the uh, from Parameter Institute. Uh, Cassia also did a master's at Parameter Institute where she worked on string field theory. And currently she's in the fourth year of her PhD uh, working under the supervision of Davide Gaiotto. And I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Uh, she's working on generally on string theory and mathematical physics uh, and particularly working on twisted holography. Uh, where she will also give a presentation now. So, Kasia, thank you for, uh, for accepting our invitation, and the floor is yours. Thank you a lot, Linda, for the introduction, and also I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here. So, uh, the topic of this talk, Twisted Holography, is in the area of string theory. So, you might know string theory as a candidate theory of quantum gravity, String theory is also very interesting to mathematicians since uh, due to its connections with various areas of the mathematics like top theory or the moonshine conjectures and more. String theory is also abundant in dualities. So the most prominent example is the ADS-CFT correspondence. So the ADS-CFT correspondence is a duality between two theories. One theory is a string theory or M theory, gravity. And the other theory is an ordinary quantum field theory without gravity. And the conjecture is that these two theories are equivalent. The idea of twisted holography is to take this original duality and twist both sides. So I, I will try to explain later what this twisting means. But what it does is that it produces a consistent subsector. Um, produces a consistent subsector. And the conjecture is that these two subsectors are also dual to each other. So this twisted duality is what we would refer to as twisted holography. Okay, so um, why do we do this? Um, so uh, it turns out that at the level of twisted holography, many simplifications occur. One simplification is that the objects that we arrive at after twisting are significantly simpler uh, than before. So for example, a twist of string theory is usually topological string theory. So this might sound more difficult, but actually topological string theories, uh, computations in topological string theory are way easier than computations in string theory. Another the reason is that this original duality is a strong weak duality. So when one side is weakly coupled, the other side is strongly coupled which makes it more difficult for us to compute things and match things on both sides. Um, so it turns out that after twisting, the dependence on such couplings drops out. So another way to say this is that this twisting restricts us to a subsector which is protected and does not depend on the couplings. And finally, one more reason why twisted holography is interesting is that um, after twisting, the objects that we end up with are way more well-defined mathematically. So for example, topological string theory and chiral algebras um, are more familiar to mathematicians. So at the level of the twisted holography, you might hope to state this duality more mathematically. And in fact, there is a proposal that the statement of twisted holography is captured by this mathematical duality called causal duality. Um, so in this talk, first I will try to review some facts about the ADS-CFT correspondence. And then I will try to explain how to twist both sides. And then I will talk about this resulting duality and its connection with causal duality. Okay, um, so the ADS-CFT correspondence is a duality between two theories. One theory, the bulk theory, uh, is a certain string theory in 10 dimensional space time, ADS 5 times S5. The second theory is four dimensional N equals for super young Mills. So, this is a special theory uh, because it has the, the maximal amount of symmetry that you can have in four dimensions. So, first of all, this theory is conformal. So, uh, for example, it's invariant under scaling. On top of that, we also have supersymmetry. The supersymmetry is a fermionic symmetry which sends bosons to fermions and fermions to bosons. 
Um, so this n equals four here, it stands for the number of supersymmetry. So n equals four in four dimension is the maximum amount of supersymmetry that we can have. Here is uh, very special because of all the symmetry, it is easier to things, but it still has some non-trivial properties that we would like to study. So this is a gauge theory. So the fields are matrix SUN. And you can think of the sphere as radius pi. So the conjecture is that these two spheres are dual. So there's a holographic dictionary which translates between these two spheres. Part of the holographic dictionary is that the operators from the boundary theory correspond to closed strings in the bulk. So for example, these four insertions here would be insertions of operators at the boundary, and they correspond to closed strings propagating in the bulk. So computing correlation functions of operators at the boundary corresponds to computing this type of scattering amplitudes of uh, closed strings interacting in the bulk. Now, uh, both of these theories have some parameters that are mapped to each other, and certain computations might be easy in certain limits of these parameters. So, for example, the gauge theory has a coupling called truth coupling. So, this coupling controls how um, it controls the interactions. So, when the truth coupling is small, we have a weakly interacting gauge theory. So, in this regime here, we can compute things with. Now, on the dual side, this coupling basically controls how stringy our string theory is. So, when we take the large truth coupling limit, we end up with a supergravity limit of string theory. Um, so, you can see the following problem. So, it turns out that the computations on the gauge theory side are easy in this regime, and the computation on the bulk side are easy in this regime. So one of the things that we would like to match is, for example, the spectrum of boundary operators with the spectrum of the closed strings. So let's say when truth coupling is zero, then we have a free gauge theory. So these operators um, have some classical dimension. Now, when we start to turn on the truth coupling, the operators get renormalized, so they can acquire anomalous dimension. So in principle, the dimension of these operators can depend on the truth coupling. So when the truth coupling is small, we can compute um, these things using perturbation theory and Feynman diagrams. On the other hand, when the truth coupling is large, we can compute the spectrum of the supergravity using perturbation theory. And the problem is that uh, it is computationally very difficult to access like the center of this parameter graph um, using perturbation theory from either side. However, there are special operators called protected operators. And these operators are special because their dimension does not depend on the truth coupling. So they're called protected because their dimensions are protected from quantum corrections. So for these operators, we can match across uh, on both sides. Uh, and the reason I'm mentioning this is that twisting gives us precisely like a way to restrict to a subsector of these protected operators. So when we twist, we throw away everything that's not protected and we keep only this protected subsector that does not depend on the truth coupling. Okay, and also I wanted to add that um, in certain limits, for example, where we take n goes to infinity, there are also other techniques that you can use to match the spectrum. For example, one technique is called integrability in the infinite and limit you can use integrability to basically match the spectrum across the top. Okay, but um, we will only consider this protected subsector. Okay, um, so one more thing I would like to review about ADS CFT conjecture is uh, where does this argument come from? So let's start with the following setup. We consider closed string theory in flat space in 10 dimensions, and we put V-brains. 
So iterands in string theory are objects where open strings can end. So if we want open strings to end anywhere in space-time, then we would have to put uh, space-filling brains filling all our ten. In this case, we only put D3 brains. So D3 brains are four-dimensional. So our open strings can only end in this four-dimensional subspace of ten-dimensional space. Okay, and we put n of these brains, and then we will take the limit and goes to infinity. And these brains are coincident. Okay, so so far we have closed strings in flat space, and we have open strings on the brains. And the closed strings can also interact with the open strings. So the closed strings can be absorbed or emitted by the brains. Then we take the low energy limit. So in the low energy limit, uh, the interactions between closed strings and open strings drop. <coughs> so in the low energy limit, we are left only with closed string theory in flat space, plus a low energy limit of this theory of open strings. What is this limit? First of all, notice that each open string can end or start on any one of these brains. So it's uh, easy to believe that like the, this limit will be a gauge theory with n by n matrices. Okay, and that uh, slow energy limit of this theory of open brains is precisely this n equals four superannuals. Okay. So this is one picture. Um, now consider a second picture. So string theory has this uh, special property, like this powerful duality called open-closed duality. So this duality tells us that on one hand, we can consider open-closed theory in the presence of brains like here. And on the other hand, we can consider just closed string theory. However, in a background, which takes into account the effect of these brains. <clears throat> okay, um, so uh, in this picture we only have closed strings, however the effect of the brains has been taken into account by changing the metric. So it turns out that the effect of these brains changes the metric from R10 to ADS5 and this 5 okay. So in this picture, far away from the brains, we still have closed strings in flat space. And then close to the brains, we have both strings in ADS5 and this 5. We take again the low energy limit. So in the low energy limit, uh, the interactions between these two sectors drop out again. And we're left again with closed string theory in R10 and a closed string theory in ADS5 and this 5. So what do we do now? We, we cancel this closed string theory in flat space in both cases. And we are left with this conjecture of duality between n equals for supernials and closed string theory. So the reason I wanted to review this is that in twisted holography we can also do this type of construction, except that we're going to have topological string theory, we will put brains, and the brains will back react the space then. Okay, so are there any questions about these last two slides? So now uh, let's go to part two. So now I'm trying to explain how to twist both sides of the duality. Um, <clears throat> so uh, twisting is this procedure of restricting to a consistent subsector of, of a So supersymmetric theories uh, have supersymmetry, which is a fermionic symmetry that sends bosons to fermions and fermions to bosons. So the generators of this symmetry are odd. So we usually denote them by Q. So since these generators are odd, they square to zero. When something squares to zero, we can try to take cohomology of it. So a cohomology of Q is defined as operators that are killed by Q. So we call them Q closed. And we identify these operators which differ by something which is Q exact. Things that are of the form Q of something, we call Q exact. Q of Q is defined as the space of closed operators modulo Q exact. 
So this notion of taking a homology might be familiar to you from the PS of page theories. When we want to quantize page theories, we uh, have to take care of the gauge invariance. So we introduce the ghosts, and then we have a lot of physical operators. So what we do then is we define a PRSD charge, and this PRSD charge also squares to zero. And then we say that the physical operators are those operators that are in the cohomology of the PRSD charge. Okay. <clears throat> so in this case, we take a cohomology of a supercharged Q. Okay. As so our twisting supersymmetric QFQs is this procedure of restricting to a cohomology of a supercharge. So why do we do this? Um, so when we restrict to cohomology, we throw away a lot of stuff. So we throw away everything that's not Q closed, and we throw away everything that's Q exact. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a way to restrict to a subsector. Okay. Then um, the operators that survive in cohomology are killed by Q. So in general, operators that are killed by some number of Qs, supercharges, are called BPS operators or protected operators. And the reason is that these are precisely the operators that do not get uh, quantum corrections to their classical dimensions, for example. Uh, and for such operators, we can prove various non-renormalization theorems. For example, for BPS operators in n equals for supremus, you can prove that the frequent functions do not depend on the coupling. Okay, so the frequent functions are, are protected. Okay, so twisting is precisely a way to restrict to the subsector of protected things don't depend on the coupling. Okay, um, one more implication of twisting is that uh, dependence on certain space-time coordinates will drop out. So these, these supercharges Q, they are generators of the supersymmetry algebra, so they satisfy some anti-commutation relations. And the anti-commutation relations of two Qs is that they anti-commute to the momentum. So there is some uh, indices here. Um, so the momenta that uh, show up here on the right-hand side, they are exact in cohomology. So notice that this momentum is equal to Q acting on something else. Okay, this by definition means that it's Q exact. Okay, um, momenta generates translations. So for certain dependence on certain coordinates will drop out in cohomology. Actually, there are many twists available. So that it depends um, what twists are available it depends on the dimension and on the amount of supersymmetry. So for example, if we pick such a Q that all the momenta are exact, then we end up with a topological sphere. So that would be called a topological twist. Then if we pick such a Q that half of the momenta are exact, that would be called a holomorphic twist. Okay. <clears throat> are there any um, questions about this construction? So we have an, a questions in our uh, anonymous uh, form. Yeah. So the question is, uh, what is meant by the word consistent subsector? What is the consistency condition? Um, it just it just means that uh, like products of operators will also be in the homology. Uh, yeah, that's like that. The, the algebra of operators is closed once we are restrict up to like two exact stuff. Okay, so now let's do a specific example of twisting. Uh, conjecture is that any four-dimensional superconformal theory, n equals two, contains a special two-dimensional subsector. Okay, so uh, notice that this theory n equals four super annuals that's relevant for holography. This theory was also superconformal, and it had even more supersymmetry. So in particular, n equals four super annuals, what we say in the slide applies to n equals four super annuals. So uh, 
n equals two supersymmetric theory has eight supercharges, which are labeled by these indices. And if we have conformal symmetry, there's also eight superconformal charges, S's. So these things also square to zero. So in total, we have uh, 16 odd generators. Okay, so now how do we find this, this to be subsector? So first we restrict to a plane. So we pick a plane, two dimensional plane in four dimensions. Um, and then we define the supercharge, which is like a linear combination of Qs and Ss. And you can check that this also squares to zero. So then we take cohomology of this supercharge. And then there's a small caveat that um, let's say that this, even if this operator is in the cohomology at the origin, when we move it a bit, it might no longer be in the cohomology. So uh, to fix this, we have to define a thing called twisted translations. So then uh, these twisted translations, they modify the operator a little bit so that when we move it, it stays in the cohomology. Okay. So to summarize, um, we pick a 2D plane, we define a special supercharge, we restrict to cohomology, we define these twisted translations, um, and it turns out that when you do this, the correlation functions are holomorphic. And so correlation functions of these operators uh, are holomorphic. So in particular, um, correlation of such operators, they could depend on both coordinates. And Z bar. However, it turns out that when you take cohomology, the dependence on the anti-holomorphic coordinate drops out. Okay, so we end up with a holomorphic two-dimensional theory. So this is an example of what we said at the previous slide that uh, when you twist, dependence on some coordinates may drop out. So here the dependence on the anti-holomorphic coordinate drops out. Okay. So we end up with a two-dimensional holomorphic theory. So this is what some physicists call a chiral algebra. And to mathematicians, this is known as a vertex operator algebra. If you are familiar with two-dimensional conformity, factorize into holomorphic and anti-holomorphic part. So you can think about this as like a half of a 2D theory. Okay. So, um, so we started with this four-dimensional theory, and we produced a two-dimensional subsector by this procedure of twisting. Okay, so this is what we will do later to n equals first brain mills in order to produce one half of twisted holograms. Okay, are there questions about this example? Hi, um, hi, Cassia, I have a question. Um, so, I mean, um, can you maybe give a, a more physical motivation of, of, or a physical understanding of what it means to have a twisted uh, operator? Uh, you mean this twisted translator or like the, the operators that survive the twist? Um, well, I think, I mean, all of it actually. <laughs> okay, okay. So. Okay, so um, just supersymmetric theories have special operators that are killed by Qs. And it turns out that when operators are killed by some number of Qs, then they have some special properties. For example, they, they do not receive uh, look, uh, quantum corrections to their scaling dimension. And another special properties, for example, some correlation functions don't depend on the coupling. Okay, so there's like this protect, protected subsector. Um, and in this protected subsector, it's easier to do computations. So twisting is like a procedure of restricting to the subsector. So we, we pick a supercharge, we go to the cohomology, and then we end up with like a nice subsector where it's easier to do computations. I, I see. So, so I mean, is, is it in some sense, uh restricting yourself to a, a, a symmetric subspace or a more symmetric uh, like it's a super symmetric right more super uh, so so you're saying that uh okay i guess i'll, I'll just keep trying to understand that uh, yeah 
yeah so it's just a it's a part of the original so we, we pick a subsector of the original theory and the subsector that we pick is special in the sense that um, correlation functions are protected and like operators don't receive uh, So maybe, maybe you can think of them as like coherent states or something. I, I don't know if we can do that. <laughs> okay, never mind. I think mean, there's a question in the chat. Okay, what is the difference between the three translations? So um so if you maybe know what R symmetry is, so um in supersymmetric theories, um R symmetry is the symmetry that rotates the supercharges, for example. So operators have some indices under R symmetry. So these operators would have some Lorentz indices and would also have some R symmetry indices. So what these twisted translations do is that they um, mix some operators with different R symmetry indices, basically. Um, yeah, and then at the end you get an operator which is like a linear combination, linear combination of an operator from uh, an asymmetry representation. Okay, so this is actually uh, so if this twisted translation produces like a linear combination of operators uh, that you get from this operator by acting with asymmetry generators from it. So uh, this is from this paper. So uh, I can uh, read this paper for more detail. Okay. So now I will I would like to talk about twisting the other side. So twisting spin theorem. So at the level of supergravity, twisting supergravity is very similar. So you can also just pick a supercharge and restrict to a cohomology. However, twisting string theory is a bit more difficult, so I would just like to state some facts about it. So the protected subsector of string theory is given by topological string theory. So um, how do we arrive at topological string theory? So string theory usually is defined from a worksheet description. So we say that at the worksheet of a string, there is some two-dimensional conformal field theory. So it turns out that for this specific uh, field theory, there exist two topological twists that you can do. Okay, so uh, for this theory, there are two inequivalent topological twists, and these twists produce topological A model and topological B model string theory. Okay, so the name topological string theory comes from the fact that you do topological twist of the word sheet. This is the so this is also the same type of a twist we were talking about that from this theory makes a topological theory. Okay, so there, there's two ways you can do this twist. There are two types of uh, topological string theory. We will focus on this topological model. Okay, <clears throat> so um, the space time of topological model is a three dimensional complex Calabi-Yau. So six real dimensions. And the space-time theory is holomorphic. So again, the name topological string theory just refers to the fact that the word sheet is topological. But the space-time theory is not topological, it's holomorphic. Okay, so since the theory is holomorphic, it, de it depends only on the complex structure. So complex structure of the manifold is a way to choose complex coordinates in every open set such that the uh, transition functions are homomorphic. So um, in topological strings, we don't have the entire metric. We only have part of the metric, which is the complex structure. Okay, so there are fields in the topological B model, which correspond to the formations of the metric. So this is analogous to like a gravity on its in string theory, in the B model, we have fields that correspond to the formations of the complex structure. So in a string theory, gravitons correspond to the formations of the metric. So this is analogous to that. 
and then difference in topological string theory happen to wrap holomorphic submanifolds. So for example, P1 brains are holomorphic complex lines. Okay, um, so now I would like to put these two things together and twist both sides of the ideas CFT correspondence. So the main example that we will do is protected subsector of the ideas 5 CFT4 example that we reviewed before. So this original duality, like we said, is between four Dianikos for supranials and a closed string theory on ADS5 and S5. So now on the on the boundary side, we do this Q plus S twist, which produces a chiral algebra. So on the, so, uh, on the sorry, right maybe side, before you continue, yeah. uh, we have a question in the chat. Uh, so the question is from Shadi Alama to ask uh, which twisted QFTs can be obtained as twisted subject sectors of larger theories. Um, yes, yeah, so, so the examples of topological twists are now are this AMD model twist. So um, in three dimensions, you can produce like one dimensional topological quantum mechanics. Uh, yeah, but I don't know. Uh, I don't know like what are the names of these topological theories. I just know that they are topological. Um, yeah, so in four dimensions, you can do a topological twist as well if you have any possible super symmetry. Uh, yeah, I just don't know uh, what 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 are the theories that what are the types of theories that we get. Okay, so. On the boundary side, we do the Q plus S twist, which produces a two-dimensional chiral algebra. And on the bulk side, the twisting this string theory produces topological B model. And the, this topological B model lives on a complex manifold, SL2C. So you probably are familiar with SL2C as a group. So here you should think about it as a complex manifold with coordinates that satisfy AD minus DC is equal to one. Um, so this complex manifold is D feomorphic to ADS three times S three. So you can think about this ADS three times S three as sitting inside this ADS five times S five. ADS five and this chiral algebra of this ADS three. And the boundary of this ADS3 is a part of this boundary. Okay, so you see that it's a sort of consistent diagram. Okay, so I will try to explain later uh, why this, in the next slide, why this manifold is SL2C. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, the conjecture is that these two theories here, they are also a component. Okay, so what are the simplifications that occur? So, like I said, um, this original duality is a strong with duality in tooth coupling. So once we twist, the tooth coupling drops out. Um, so uh, an implication of that is that computations in the chiral algebra are basically three theory computations. So if you want to compute correlation functions, you just do like with contractions, and there's no loop corrections. Okay, so this is in the um, same term. Um, another um, simplification is that the D brains in here are just holomorphic submanifolds of this complex manifold. So again, this is easier than studying some if some supergravity solutions in ADS5 and S5. Sorry. And then finally, uh, the objects that we get here are way more well-defined mathematically. So chiral algebras are known to mathematicians as vertex of algebras, and topological B model is also quite well defined mathematically. So at this level, you can try to state this duality more mathematically. I call them duality that I will talk about at the end. Um, Okay, so once we are at this 
once we arrive at this twisted duality, we can forget about the original theory and just treat it as duality on its own. So in this case, we can also uh, make the same argument with back reacting D brains. So again, let's consider a closed string theory in flat space, except that this time we have topological B model and the flat space is C3. Again, uh, we only care about the complex structure. Uh, and we also could B put a stack of brains. In this case, we put D1 brains instead of D3 brains because we want these brains to support the two-dimensional theory. And when we take the low energy limit, it turns out that the theory of open strings on these brains is precisely the chiral algebra. Okay. So then we want to take into account the effect of the brains on the on the system. Uh, so it turns out that these brains back react the uh, space time and they change the complex structure from C3 to SL2C. Okay, so again, we consider topological B model in flat space, we put brains. Here it and leaves on these brains is precisely this chiral algebra. Then it turns out that these brains change the complex structure from C3 to SL2C. Okay. Um, are there any questions about this? Uh, so we have another anonymous question. Mm -hmm. So the question says, uh, does twisting preserve the central charge in CFT? Uh, can we make sure that there is no well anomaly after twisting? It doesn't. So, um, the, so for example, in this chiral algebra subsector, um, the, if this is a unitary theory, then the central charge of this theory is bigger than zero. However, when you twist, you end up with a chiral algebra with a negative central charge. Yeah, so it does. So the, the chiral algebra of unitary theories have negative central charge, for example. So it doesn't preserve the uh, charge. And then about the way anomaly, I, I don't know what to say. Um, so finally, I would like to discuss the uh, connection of twisted holography with causal duality. Mathematical duality that also happens to appear in physics. So one way it appears in physics is that if we want to ask how do we couple a one-dimensional topological quantum mechanical system to a QFT. So let's consider a one-dimensional topological defect. So then let's say that the algebra of operators is D on this defect. Now, since this is topological direction, then it doesn't matter where we place these operators, only the order of the matters. So we have an associative algebra of operators. And then let's say that A is the algebra of operators in the bulk. Okay, so um, causal duality appears in the following way. It turns out that all the possible couplings of these two algebras are equivalent to giving a map from the causal dual algebra to the algebra of operators on the defect. Okay, so that's a bit difficult, but um, the physical interpretation is that the causal dual algebra is the algebra of the couplings of the universal defect. So the reason is that any defect B we pick here, there would be a map from this causal dual algebra to this defect. So we can sort of think about this as the universal defect. Okay, so there also exists a mathematical definition. So I just wanted to show um, that it exists. Um, and now what's the connection of this with twisted holography? So notice that this question of like coupling defects to bulk is sort of what we've been doing with the brains. You can think about brains as like higher dimensional defects, okay? So in our case, uh, the algebra of closed strings be like the analog of this algebra. And then the algebra of operators at the brain would be like the analog of 
and defect algebra. So we are usually interested in uh, brains that are higher dimensional. So causal duality has mostly been studied for that is one dimensional associative algebras. So um, for example, for two dimensional chiral algebras, um, it's still work in progress to define the like, correct statement of causal duality. Um, there's also a way to take into account the back reaction of the brains. So if we back react the brains, um, that would modify both of these algebras, A and B. And the proposal is that the correct statement to take that into account is And I just wanted to emphasize that causal duality, like this ubiquitous uh, duality in mathematics that happens to also appear in physics, and the proposal is that this is like the correct mathematical statement that captures holography, at least at this twisted level. Okay, so finally, I uh, so I wanted to say there are many other examples of twisted holography. So various other standard examples like ADS free CF2. There's also a lot of examples of twisted M theory. So you can generate a lot of these examples by considering like topological string theory or M theory and putting brains and then trying to back react it. Um, and there exist examples where we can find the holographic dual of a twist of a theory, even though the holographic dual of the untwisted theory is not known. Um, and finally, recently there's been a lot of new interesting graphing of celestial holography. So here they consider six dimensional theories on the twistorial space. So this is like a lot of our favorite words in one place. Um, and Finally, there's also been uh, recently a proposal of this holography in flat space. So here they consider topological string theory. They put brains, the back react, but it turns out that the back reacted space time is still asymptotically flat. Okay. So yeah, I wanted to leave you with this list of examples. And this is all I have to say. Thank you. I thank you very much. So if we can stop the recording, we can go to the question session.